Good morning, everyone, and thanks for joining us. My name is Lia Greeno, and I manage the Evaluation and Program Effectiveness Working Group at Interaction, the largest coalition of U.S.-based international NGOs. I'd like to welcome you to the eighth and final webinar in our Impact Evaluation Guidance Note and Webinar Series. Um, the series, developed with financial support from the Rockefeller Foundation, consists of four uh, guidance notes on impact evaluation, each of which is accompanied by two webinars. Um, today's webinar is the second associated with the fourth guidance note in the series, Use of Impact Evaluation Results by David Bonbright. We have three presenters joining us today from the Millennium Challenge Corporation, or MCC, and Oxfam Great Britain. From the MCC, we actually have Jack Molyneux, Director of Impact Evaluation, joining us rather than his colleague Jennifer Sturdy, who you saw in the invitation, as well as Catherine Farley, Senior Director of Agriculture and Land. From Oxfam GB, we have Carl Hughes, Program Effectiveness Team Lead, who is joining us from the UK. I'm very happy to have Jack, Catherine, and Carl presenting today, since both the MCC and Oxfam GB have recently publicly released some impact evaluation results. They're all then dealing firsthand with the challenge of ensuring that those results are used, something that we'll be hearing about very shortly. Um, I'll start things today with a quick overview of the series, um, and we'll then turn it over to our presenters. The slides and webinar recording will be posted on Interactions websites afterwards. We'll save the questions and answers until both presentations have ended, and then I'll, I'll wrap things up. As those who have joined us for previous webinars know, the purpose of this guidance note and webinar series is to increase organizations' understanding of and ability to conduct high-quality impact evaluation. Our aim isn't to tell organizations exactly what to do, but rather to provide them with sufficient information so they can make better decisions around impact evaluation. The four notes in the series are Introduction to Impact Evaluation by Patricia Rogers, Linking Monitoring and Evaluation to Impact Evaluation by Bert Perrin, Introduction to Mixed Methods and Impact Evaluation by Michael Bamberger, and Use of Impact Evaluation Results by David Bonbright. While the series is targeted at NGO staff in particular, the notes and series of webinars should be useful to staff and other types of organizations as well, and, and we've actually had a wide variety of organizations joining us for this webinar series so far. Um, with the exception of the third guidance note on mixed methods, which is a little longer and more technical than the rest, each note is just about 20 pages in length, so they're really just an introductory resource on these topics and are intended to raise the issues that those involved in impact evaluation should be thinking about, as well as to provide some practical guidance. As I mentioned earlier, each guidance note in the series is accompanied by two webinars, one more theoretical, the other more focused on actual practice. In March, we launched the first guidance note with a webinar in which Patricia Rogers gave a basic introduction to impact evaluation. We followed that with a webinar featuring presentations from Allison Davis of Oxfam America and Mulu Chekel and Larry Dershem of Save the Children, who presented brief case studies of impact evaluations conducted in El Salvador, Palestine, and Kazakhstan. In April, Bert Perrin presented on the second note in the series, and in the webinar that followed, John Kurtz presented on how Mercy Corps has used existing data from program m &E and secondary sources in recent impact evaluations, and Celeste Lemro of Africare on how monitoring data influenced the direction of impact evaluations of programs in Ghana and Niger. Our fifth webinar in September was with Michael Bamberger, who presented on the third guidance note on mixed methods. In the following webinar, Jeannie Anon of the International Rescue Committee and Megan Gash of Freedom from Hunger presented examples of mixed methods impact evaluations at their organizations, which involved programs in Thailand and Mali. And finally, our last webinar last week was with David Bonbright, who gave an overview of his note on use of impact evaluation results. The guidance notes, along with the recordings and presentations from the seven webinars we've had to date, are available at the link you see on your screen. As you can see, each note is being translated into several languages, and translated versions of the first and second guidance notes are already available. Um, so, so please share these with others who could make use of these translated versions. 
Um, just one more thing before I turn things over to um, Jack and Catherine. Um, if you would like to minimize or maximize this webinar screen, just click on the orange arrow. Um, you can view the presentations in full screen mode by clicking on the blue box below that. Um, you don't have access to the raise the hand feature and you'll be on mute for the rest of the presentations, but if you have a question, please type it into this question box. And you can send the questions to me as you think of them so we can jump straight into our Q&A once the presentations are completed. Um, so Jack and Catherine, I am going to turn it over to you now to start Great. your presentation. Thanks a lot, uh, Leah. Um, let me turn on our screen. Um, Leah, this is a great opportunity for MCC to participate in this discussion. Um, it's a really exciting time here. Um, we're discussing the, the use of the impact evaluations um, really as a part of um, an October rollout of impact evaluations of farmer training activities in five countries. Um, we're learning tons from this and our outreach to key stakeholders has been substantial. So this is really a fun time to be talking about this. Um, uh, before, uh, before we dive into our learning from these impact evaluations, I'd like to put some of these uh, evaluations into the context of the broader MCC model. MCC, as I hope many of you know, is a results-driven agency and a learning organization. David Bonbright's guidance note points out that many organizations can suffer from learning anxiety, which keeps them from shifting away from doing what they always do uh, in order to try something new. One of the nice things about being in a relatively a young organization and an organization that has a commitment to this model is that it helps us to manage the effects of this type of learning anxiety. From its inception, MCC has been committed to using evidence to inform our decisions. When there isn't enough data or enough evidence to, uh, to help us understand how projects might work, we set out to build the evidence, primarily through our investments in independent impact and performance evaluations. At MCC, we do evaluations for two primary reasons. The first is accountability. We use these evaluations to understand whether or not our investments are having the intended impacts. In our case, the objective is reducing poverty by increasing household incomes. The second reason for our evaluations is learning. We use these evaluations to test the hypotheses under, underlying our program logic and build evidence on why we see the impacts that we see or that we don't see. This is huge. All of our major activities undergo independent evaluation, and 40% of them undergo the most intense form of evaluation, these impact evaluations, which aim to show whether it was MCC's investment that affected outcomes rather than, effect, rather than factors that affect everybody. So before we head into the discussion, it's important for us to distinguish how MCC defines impact evaluation. The, in, the interaction guidance note uh, uses a broad definition for impact evaluation. The first note, in fact, defines impact evaluation as any evaluation that systematically and empirically investigates the impacts produced um, by an intervention. It's important for me to note that MCC utilizes a range of monitoring and evaluation tools to systematically collect evidence on the impacts of its investments, including country-based monitoring systems and performance and impact evaluations. But MCC uses a much narrower definition of its impact evaluations than the one suggested by the series. First off, in our definition, these are independent. Outside independent evaluators assess every major MCC activity. The reason for this is really twofold. First, we want an unbiased estimate of impacts and interpretation of results and getting it outside of MCC, who is ultimately the implementing agency, uh, is important to get that independence. And second, we need levels of technical expertise to lead these evaluations 
and it's not possible to manage these in-house. Secondly, these evaluations are rigorous, meaning that in order to be defined as an impact evaluation, there must be a clearly defined treatment and control group so that the evaluators can estimate the impacts that are attributable to MCC's investments. And finally, they're rare in many fields. Um, a World Bank study looking at training of farmers identified only three impact evaluations using experimental designs anywhere in the world that were produced over the last decade. MCC with the, this October rollout already has five and several more are coming. Next, I want to talk a little bit about evaluation to do. First off, they test assumptions about how or whether interventions led to the increased household incomes. Second, they build evidence that, feed, that feeds into course correction and future decision making. And finally, they test this notion of attribution. Can our projects fairly take credit for the impact, or was it something that would have happened anyway? So today, what I want to, what, what Kathy and I are going to go through is uh, to discuss the results of these first five uh, MCC financed evaluations of, of these farmer training interventions. And more importantly, we want to talk about how these results are being used immediately by MCC to strengthen our program and evaluation activities. Um, we'll close with a reflection on the three main themes from the guidance note on understanding our evaluation uses, strengthening our organizational structure for using evaluation results, and understanding the incentives that are needed to use these evaluation results well. So first, um, let's put uh, these first five impact evaluations into the broad context of how MCC invests. As I said, these are all of farmer training activities in five of MCC's earliest compacts. These in particular are Armenia, El Salvador, Ghana, Honduras, and Nicaragua. This context visual gives you a breakout of the Ghana Compact. Um, it was made up of three major projects. These included agriculture, which are the blue slices, uh, rural development, which you see in red, and transportation, which you see in green. Within the agriculture project, there were six activities, one of which is farmer training. That slice, that red outline slice, is the piece that we're talking about today. Most of the other components of, of these compacts have independent evaluations too, either performance or impact evaluations. Together with our monitoring data and the economic analyses, these are going to help us round out a fuller story on each overall impact. In terms of dollar value, these farmer training programs represent about 13% of the total value of these five compacts. Looking at MCC's broader portfolio, it represents only about 2% of what we've committed to date. So a small piece of the pie, uh, but the amount that we're learning from these first five evaluations um, is really huge. Um, and how the agency is learning uh, how to improve current and future activities is turning out to be really exciting for us. Um, let's move into the and uh, talk about the program logic. Um, I think for this group, much of this is going to be familiar, but I'm going to walk through it just to make sure that we're on the same page, both in terms of terminology um, and in terms of uh, what we're measuring. The results of any evaluations need to be placed in the context of what, what really needs to be a very clearly defined program or causal logic. It's the foundation for our understanding of how the projects work and how we measure them. First, when we look at this program logic in terms of how they work, the first two boxes included in this slide are project inputs, money spent, and outputs. In this case, we talk about farmers trained or hectares uh, of land under cultivation. The program logic lays out how we expect these inputs and outputs to translate into outcomes. 
Some of these outcomes are triggered early, like adoption of new techniques. But some come later, things like increases in crop yields. But MCC has tried, tries to take this beyond these measures, to connect the dots to the ultimate outcomes we aim to achieve, increases in farm incomes, and ultimately changes in household incomes. Now, in terms of how we measure, our monitoring data capture these inputs and outputs, and it also tracks some of the outcome, such as adoption of new techniques. Now, I want to point out that when we're looking at outputs, at inputs, outputs, and even some of these early incomes, MCC did very well. Um, the average completion rate of targets specified to the activities covered by these evaluations is we hit 103% of the targets in Ghana, 103% of targets in Armenia, 112% of the targets in Nicaragua, uh, in El Salvador and Honduras were all well over 100, 125% uh, of targets. Um, but we want to go beyond just these uh, outcomes and outputs. Um, let's look to the right of this red line. From here, I want to emphasize how uh, two ways that MCC broke new ground back in when it was initiated in 2004. First, we committed to using impact evaluations to test whether the outcomes were changed specifically by an MCC investment rather than by external factors that affect everyone. This is about the attribution that I keep coming back to. We would not be able to do this with the monitoring data alone because it only captures information about the treatment groups. It doesn't tell us about a counterfactual. And then, and here's where we really push the envelope. Because we're committed to reducing poverty through income growth, we try to measure whether our investments ultimately increase household income. This is difficult, and it's difficult for two reasons. First, household income is difficult to measure through survey data. In some cases, evaluators try to use proxies such as per capita consumption to get around these issues, but it doesn't. But it remains a it may, remains a tough nut to crack. Second, household income tends to come from various sources. Even if farm income increases, it doesn't necessarily mean a direct increase in overall household incomes, because farmers may decide to reallocate household resources, notably most notably um, labor resources, from other activities. Um, to farming, and that could reduce income from these other activities. I, I want to clarify, this is a really challenging space to be in. Very few organizations try to connect the dots all the way to household income, and that's what we're trying to do, both in how we design the projects and in how we measure them. Now, MCC sees, sees impact evaluations as the primary tool for connecting these dots. Okay. Let's, let's jump to these findings now. We have a variety of them. Um, this variety of findings is, should not be surprising in the development business. And for those involved in impact evaluations, I don't think anyone should be surprised. Let's start off and talk about some of the positive impacts that we measured. The first panel shows positive impacts on farm incomes in three of the, three of the countries we were working in. I'll pull out El Salvador uh, uh, dairy as, as an example. In El Salvador, we found that dairy farmers' incomes roughly doubled as a result of adopting new techniques that are project promoted. Ghana and Nicaragua, there were very different things going on, but again, we saw significant increases in farm incomes. Then there were some activities where the evaluators did not detect impacts at the time of the evaluation. For example, in two of the regions in Ghana, there were no measured impacts. But the evaluation period was limited to only one year, which is very likely too short to capture the full range of farmer responses. So the, the verdict may still be out. Um, in Armenia and El Salvador, there are different stories. Um, ones that we can go into given enough time in the question and answer period. But now there are two cases where the evaluators simply cannot measure impacts because of flaws in the impact evaluation. And this really highlights a good point 
that the guidance note series flags. And that is that doing impact evaluations well is really hard. Kathy's going to get into this in lessons learned. But I want to point out that in Honduras, the evaluator was unable to identify a, a control group of farmers similar to those um, that were involved in the program. And that meant that, that the evaluator was not able to reliably estimate a counterfactual. Without this, the impact evaluation just couldn't come up with the causal impact that we found was a, uh, a compelling measure of the effect of uh, farmer training on outcomes. So overall, we need to be clear. The evaluators did not measure changes in household income in any of these five countries. In Ghana, the evaluators didn't report it. We'll know more about this as we get into the data and figure out what actually happened. In the two failed evaluation cases, as I mentioned, we can't measure the impacts because of flaws in the evaluation. But the other cases <clears throat> illustrate an interesting conundrum that we're grappling with. We met a lot of our targets. We did very well on those, on those fronts. But when we try to connect the dots to household income, we haven't been able to measure it, not yet at least. And yet, in each of these cases, we're learning tons, and we're applying and sharing these widely, which takes us to the most important, and I think the most fun part of all, is how we're acting on these findings. And Kathy has the honor of walking you guys through that. Yeah, thanks, Jack. We are really learning a lot, both in terms of how to do farmer training better and how to do evaluation better. And this is really exciting territory for, for MCC and for the Ag Practice Group especially. Um, and I want to highlight in this discussion some of the main lessons we are learning. And all five of these have a common theme, working in lockstep. And it is virtually impossible to have a successful impact evaluation if implementers and evaluators are not working in lockstep right from the start. And that seems obvious, but sometimes, as we all know, it's more challenging than, than it would appear to be on paper. And what does this mean? For MCC, this means that we need to hire evaluators early to ensure coordination with implementers early. And this can be early can be as early as when we're in the design phase of the project, and that would be the ideal situation. Align incentives for implementers. Until now, MCC's, MCA's contract implementers have varying incentives to coordinate with evaluators, and we need to do better about aligning those incentives. And moving forward, MCC will work with the MCAs to align incentives to better uh, to enable uh, better implementation of impact evaluations. And this specifically means, you know, cons very clear specific contracts where expectations are identified up front, what we mean by impact evaluation, who's responsible for what data collection, how it fits in with the design. And we apply that in some of our uh, more recent uh, evaluations and you know it's a learning process as well you just when you think you get it right you wish you, you tweak that contract slightly so um, and then finally we need to strengthen the internal MCC process to ensure program design and implement to ensure the program design and implementation team is working with the evaluation team on evaluation questions quality control and dissemination of evaluation results this is really about understanding who should be around the table ultimately understanding our users and when so those key milestones in an evaluation when it's critical to check in, assess status, and course correct if necessary. And I just want to note that we have recently published a paper um, in collaboration with USAID and Feed the Future, which talks about challenges of implementation of impact evaluations. It covers a lot of these themes in, in more depth and has some specific examples from, from some of the MCA's uh, active and closed compacts. So in addition to working in lockstep, the evaluation results are being used by MCA, MCC and MCAs to improve how we do program and evaluation design and implementation. The top four lessons coming out of the evaluation results that MCC and MCAs are using to improve program design and implementation going forward are something I'm going to discuss now. The first one is testing traditional approaches. One of our biggest takeaways is the need to test assumptions about commonly used approaches. This should be one of our most important contributions to the broader development community. Let me cite one interesting example, starter kits. Starter kits are packages of inputs, 
seeds, fertilizers, and equipment designed to complement farmer training. And as we all know, starter kits have been a favor for donors and country partners for years and are still very common. And in fact, we use them in four of the five projects we're talking about today. And the findings across these five impact evaluations sort of pulled together are, ask, are leading us to ask, do starter kits drive behavior change in farmers the way we expected? And in several cases, the findings suggest they did not. And the development community ought to understand why. And we're not saying drop starter kits, don't do starter kits. But we do see this as an area for more impact evaluations to learn when and how best to use them, and over time build up an evidence base of proven practice. And this is just one of many examples. And, 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 and in Mozambique, we are, there's been an opportunity in one of our active compacts to, to, to tweak the evaluation process to try to dig in deeper and understand some more about how starter kits can be more effective and in what context. The second is understand time horizon. Some of our assumptions were too aggressive in terms of how quickly farmers would change behavior. In other cases, implementation delays narrowed the window in which we could observe this change. Our takeaway here is that you need to be patient. Build in and stick to timelines in the evaluation that allow adequate time to measure change, even when the implementation delays squeeze the whole project timeline. Um, we are, I, I'm not sure if Jack talked about it. I can't. We have in other settings in Armenia, the example is, and, and even in Ghana, we, we, we didn't allow enough time to measure change. And we're already applying this lesson in Mozambique, Morocco, Namibia, and Burkina Faso active compacts to make sure we're allowing enough time to measure impact and rescheduling the final evaluation survey if we need to. And what this means in many situations is that we will do that final evaluation after the compact ends. Use program logic, lesson number three. The case of Armenia showed us the importance of always going back to the program logic during implementation, especially in integrated projects that pair training with irrigation or rural roads, for example. In Armenia, the irrigation infrastructure was delayed, but farmer training went ahead on schedule. And this created a big gap right in the middle of the program logic. Trained farmers didn't have reliable access to water. And this was, you know, up front one of the major drivers of, of behavior change. In retrospect, and then at the same time, we continued on with the evaluation. It began and ended before the irrigation was in place. So in retrospect, we should have pressed pause and reconsidered the timing of both the training and of the data collection for the evaluation. And that's exactly what we're doing now in Moldova, one of our active compacts. We've already rescheduled farmer training in response to anticipated infrastructure delays. And this is going to help keep activities aligned with the program launch. Now Jack is going to walk us through some lessons or those were sort of areas related to ag projects and implementation of ag projects mm -hmm. and Jack's going to walk us through some of the learnings around improving how we do evaluations. Thanks Kathy. So in addition to informing how the MCA and the MCAs, MCC and the MCAs can improve on program design and implementation, uh, we're learning a lot uh, about how to improve doing the evaluations. <clears throat> The uh, first off, MCC needs to do a better job of ensuring that the evaluators uh, design impact evaluations for learning. Some of our early evaluations were more heavily focused on this idea of accountability. Did our investments increase incomes? And less on learning why they did or didn't increase incomes, how it was that they worked. Um, we found that we can do a better job of understanding the why if we adapt our evaluators to design the evaluations for this purpose. So uh, it means several things. First, uh, we, we, we're going to need to be more selective. We're going to focus on uh, projects where the learning potential is the greatest. Second, we're going to work closely with sector experts and our country partners to find out where there is a real need to learn to inform what works. And third, when things go wrong, and they will, we've got to be ready to shift gears early to make smart decisions to evaluation plans as reality bites and changes our initial plans. Um, we also will focus on using appropriate methodologies. Um, MCC needs to align incentives in order for this, uh, in order for the evaluators to use the appropriate evaluation methodology, <coughs> excuse me, 
and recognize that it may not always be feasible or preferable to use random assignment. Um, uh, a randomized rollout or any other rigorous method for estimating the counterfactual is, is, a, uh, uh, is any method is appropriate. Excuse me. <coughs> Finally, MCC have committed to using household income as the measure for ultimate impact. However, as discussed earlier, this is difficult to measure and we need to be more real we need we need much more realistic uh, time horizons for how long it may take to see changes in household incomes. For this reason, evaluators are working with us to explore more appropriate proxies for household income and we're working on evaluation time horizons um, that need to be taken under consideration. Um, and lastly, in, uh, and lastly, um, we've got to work on these incentives. This discussion note seems to uh, really reflect on uh, um, internal incentives. But in MCC, we're thinking about two, pardon me, yeah. Sorry, we're, we're, we're getting our slides mixed up. And I, we're getting confused because it looks like our screen sharing is paused. I'm going to come back to this and see if this comes back up. Please bear with us. <coughs> We're back on target. Um, so now we've got the three themes that the guidance note provided. How does this fit in with what we're doing? Uh, there's a lot of overlap here that we hope has already been apparent. On the first theme related to uses, there is a significant amount of overlap between what we're doing and what the guidance note suggests. MCC sees a wide number of uses for these evaluations and identifying them all early and understanding both our roles and responsibility in making these, making sure that these come to fruition, and the roles and responsibilities of the MCA, the MCAs, these are our accountable entities that work within the country, and those of our independent evaluators. These are essential to make sure, understanding these roles and responsibility are essential in order to make sure that all of the stakeholders that stand to benefit from, uh, from these varied uses have realistic expectations about what they're going to be able to get out of them and when they're likely to be able to use them. A lot came out of these first few evaluations. Our users uh, include MCC, including the M&E team, our sector teams for these um, evaluations, it was our ag sector team that were most that was most directly involved. Our program managers in country, MCC's board, Congress, which is our source of funding, and the, ultimately the American taxpayer. Um, for MCA, the counterparts are their own uh, monitoring and evaluation team. They've got their own sector teams, their management. They've got a board. Uh, they each have a board that's assigned by, that's appointed by their government, um, and their government, um, which is usually represented by their Ministry of Finance. Other users of our results include academics, NGOs, I hope that much of this group is included, implementers, and others who can hopefully take what we learn and apply it elsewhere. Um, in a post-compact environment, MCC is actively trying to support the critical role of the independent evaluator to disseminate the results and the learning. And in addition, MCC is playing a critical role <coughs> to convert the learning into action, either through course correction or future decision making around program selection design. <coughs> this, as the note suggests, integrated with theme two around the organizational structure it needs to be uh, um, integrated with the organizational structure. MCC has already integrated the use of evaluations into its highest levels of management. And evaluation designs and results are discussed throughout the project cycle and through all levels of MCC's management. 
But the lessons coming out of these five evaluations have pointed the need to strengthen our internal review process. We've got to formalize who needs to be involved and when on these evaluation-related decisions. It's not purely M&E. We need to have the sectors involved, and we've got to have our country counterparts engaged. This is essential for strengthening buy-in, identifying the appropriate users, and tailoring these evaluation products for our various users. And finally, getting the incentives right is a real challenge. The discussion note seems to really reflect on internal incentives. But at MCC, <coughs> we really need to, and I think that this is probably true with all implementing agencies, we need to think about two main issues around incentives. First, we've got to ensure that our culture of learning reflects the demands of our funders. In our case, it's Congress and it's uh, the U.S. taxpayer. We need to make sure that they really have the appetite to fund and to use evaluation results. This is probably a challenge for NGOs out there as well. How to help donors stay engaged and informed of the opportunities for real improvements in effective delivery of development assistance. Because without buy-in from the funding agencies, good managers are going to have a really hard time coming up with appropriate internal uh, assistance. Jack, sorry, I don't mean to, to rush you, but we, we do need to turn it over to Carl soon, so maybe you could wrap up in is, the next minute. This is the last slide, and I have two sentences. Great, thanks. We, these findings matter, but it's what we do with them that matter most. We have this model of uh, what turns good startups into great businesses is that they employ this rigorous feedback loop. Build, measure, and learn. And that's what we're trying to do. Thank you very much for your patience. Great. Thank you, Jack and Catherine. Carl, I'm going to make you the, the presenter now. Okay, great. Um, great to be here. Thanks to uh, Leila for hosting this and uh, for Jack and Catherine for the wonderful presentation. Um, I'm going to talk about uh, Oxfam uh, GB's uh, effectiveness reviews, sort of an umbrella term for kind of our evaluation work, some of which is uh, impact assessment, and how we're trying to get that to lead to more effective programming, so ultimately to make the, the organization more effective. And I'm afraid... computer is frozen. One second. Okay, so uh, in terms of the outline of my presentation, um, we're looking at uh, just an overview of what, what Oxfam's effectiveness reviews are, what they are and how they work. Again, I'm having problems, uh, didn't happen on the practices. I'll just put them all up. Um, and then I'm going to talk about in part B, how, how we're trying to, uh, what we put in place to try to increase the use of these so they don't just sit on the shelves but they actually get used. And then I'm going to talk about some examples from the field of, of uh, kind of a real reality check on if to what extent they're being used, so kind of positive and negative examples. And then kind of learning and building from that kind of what we're trying to do forward to, to, to further try to, to ensure that these things, the results of these uh, effectiveness reviews get used. So just uh, first looking at the, the effectiveness reviews, um, just to put it into the organizational context, um, Oxfam GB is, is uh, the UK's biggest uh, international development organization. So we're working in 55 countries, approximately 250 programs, 1,200 projects operating at any given time. Multiple thematic areas, Oxfam kind of just does it, has its hands in everything. and. Um, uh, from livelihoods work to women's empowerment, uh, disaster risk reduction, um, basically you name it, Oxfam does it. Um, and various kind of approaches. We have humanitarian approaches, more traditional developmental approaches, and uh, also campaigning and advocacy, popular mobilization um, work. 
But unfortunately, like many NGOs, we have limited capacity and resources, or at least resources have been allocated for rigorous um, evaluation, rigorous impact evaluation. But at the same time, we have a senior management that does, you know, wants immediate effectiveness feedback, immediate effectiveness on our results um, in a credible way. Um, so we have all these kind of competing tensions within the organization. So what kind of senior management should try to grapple with this kind of external pressure to demonstrate Oxfam's effectiveness? They, they thought, okay, hey, if we can just pin down some global indicators, get all our country programs to capture data on them, um, we'll, uh, we'll, we'll address this challenge. But us as kind of technical people are saying, hey, I mean, wait, this is going to be re resource and time intensive, and actually it's not going to tell us much about Oxfam effectiveness, particularly because of, of the, the attribution problem. How are we going to link all these, even if we're able to get all this outcome data and, and track it over time, how are we going to link this back to our work unless we have it backed up by some kind of uh, rigorous evaluation designs? So we convinced them of this. We came up with, with a kind of a compromise. Um, let's collect data on all our, um, all our projects, get them to collect and report output data. Um, through our systems, and then evaluate a random selection of mature projects as rigorously as possible within the existing uh, resource constraints that we have. So this came kind of the birth of our um, the effectiveness reviews that we're, we're undertaking, which I'll describe a little bit about in a second. But some of you may wonder, you know, why, why are we doing the random selection? Why isn't it more a strategic selection of, of, of projects and programs? And, and why projects in their mature phases? Ultimately, the answer to this question is so we can really get a better sense of, of the organization's true effectiveness. So you can imagine if we did kind of a strategic proposal selection, we may be cherry-picking, picking on the, the, the big flagship programs, avoiding the, the smaller ones or the ones we maybe aren't so interested in evaluating, and we wouldn't really get a sense of, of the organization's general effectiveness. And, and definitely, as, as, as most of us know, um, if we were able to select them on, on at, at baseline before they are started, we would be able to uh, pursue more rigorous uh, impact evaluation designs. Even if we didn't do random selection, we could at least do a difference in difference approach. But at the same time, you know, when you start pursuing these rigorous evaluation designs, you actually improve or you increase the level of attention and effort that goes in delivering these programs. So if, if we it would be great if we did that. We randomly select some projects that were just starting up, and we set up some rigorous evaluation designs, but then they'd get a lot of attention, and, and people would know they're being evaluated, and we wouldn't get the general picture of how effective the organization is. So this, coupled with the fact that, that, that senior management wants immediate feedback, we decided that we'll try our best to, to, to look at projects ex post after they've been evaluated or after they're very mature and rigorous them and try to evaluate them the best we can in that context. So we have different approaches for, for doing this uh, evaluation work um, for different types of interventions and they all kind of sit under this umbrella that we call effectiveness reviews. So humanitarian um, uh, interventions, we don't actually look at trying to establish a counterfactual or anything. We just look at adherence to quality standards. To what extent says that the, the, the response in question adhered to these 12 benchmarks that, that, are, that are recognized for good humanitarian programming. For our kind of community development work, or what are also called large end interventions, so programs and projects targeting many people, we, we adopt a kind of quasi-experimental uh, approach. We have comparison and, and, and intervention groups, and we use propensity score matching and, and uh, multivariable regression, other means to try to identify the treatment effects using some recall techniques to try to reconstruct some, some baseline data, um, household uh, wealth assets and stuff, to, so we can kind of control for some baseline differences in, in wealth status and so forth. For our um, citizen voice or policy influencing, kind of the advocacy related work, um, where we're really trying to affect one thing, could be change in policy or change in, in, in the practice of a duty bearer. Um, we're using a qualitative approach that we've adapted from a, a qualitative case study technique called process tracing using the political science. 
and it's, it's kind of a form of contribution analysis. So we're really evidencing the extent the outcome change has happened and then looking at the competing explanations or if, um, that were responsible and see if there's any evidence that actually uh, our in, uh, interventions um, can be linked to, to any evidenced outcome changes that have taken place. Um, and the next part, what I'm going to talk about is what we've actually tried to put in place to ensure use of the, the findings of all these effectiveness reviews. And we've done a number of things. We don't want to end up, um, for all the effectiveness reviews, sitting on, on, on the shelf collecting dust. And we, we, as evaluators, we really fear that happening. One of the key things, and it's kind of recognized um, kind of in, the, in the evaluation use literature, is to make sure key people are involved in, in, in the process right from the start. So even though they're not involved, they get randomly selected, and they have no choice to be involved in these things, we still try to involve program teams and partners in the whole process. So one, one of the things is some kind of light training and, and orientation, you know, why do we need a comparison group, different, uh, different approaches to, to dealing with causal inference that kind of thing, really trying to um, work with them to, to look at their theory of change or their, their, their logic model underlying the, the, the project in question. Yes, a lot of times these are written up in project proposals, but often it's not totally clear, so we spend some time working with them to really make it as clear as possible so we actually know which different um, outcomes we, we want to measure, and then we can adapt our data collection instruments um, accordingly. And then even um, looking at uh, work, having them involved in the process of identifying um, the intervention groups that we're going to collect data from, the comparison groups. So kind of this, this first stage of our, our quantitative techniques that we use is, is purposive matching of, of intervention areas with, with sensibly, plausibly matched um, comparison areas. So that when the results come out, they're, they're going to believe that, yeah, there's either a, we can have faith that, that there's a difference, or if there's no difference, they're not going to try to uh, make some excuse for it. Other other th thing that we really tried to do, and, and you know, Oxfam is one of these organizations that's both very decentralized and very devolved at country level, but at the same time very hierarchical. So a lot of a lot of things are, are if you want to get anything done at head office here, it's really got to be through the chain chain of command. So. Um, these uh, effectiveness reviews are kind of a uh, senior management initiative and, and they, they go right from the international director to regional director, country director, right down to the program team. And that's been really important to have that senior management backing and support. Another thing is that we related to that as a response system that so <coughs> country teams that are, that, that are lucky enough to be subjected to these effectiveness reviews must uh, uh, complete a management response and, and send this on to the international director. So the management response is overseen to the, uh, the, by the international dire director. This is the management response. It looks a little convoluted and complicated. Um, if you're going to put one together, maybe try to make it a bit more simple. But we've, uh, this is what we have in place. We actually had a consultant to help us work this out. And then we actually had to revisit it because it was too complicated. Um, and, and this is what uh, my colleagues have come up with. Um, the other, the other important thing is, is you know, we, we have different types of reports. So we have the, the like MCC has is the the, the, the full reports, very technical. Um, not everyone can understand the statistics and, and and what's involved. So we have shorter, kind of more communicable communication projects. Um, we have these kind of short. If you go to our website on the effectiveness reviews, we have these shorter um, two-page uh, summary snapshots. Um, and we have, we've adopted this traffic light system. Um, this is, which I'll, I'll go into in a little while, it's kind of a double-edged sword. It's great for kind of communicating and getting people to, to understand the, the top line results, but then can also be misinterpreted as well. Um, we also have planned efforts to try to drill down on unexpected results with, with further qualitative investigation. So. In the last year's cohort, we did 26 of these effectiveness reviews. One standout has, has been really successful, this disaster risk reduction um, uh, program in, in Pakistan. Really strong evidence for some, some um, positive effects in terms of reducing risk to floods. So we want to drill down, down on that and figure out you know, what was going on there, what really made the program work. It wasn't just the, the, the intervention. Was it something to do with the relationships the partners had with the communities? You know, what was really going on? 
But at the same time, we have some kind of bigger flagship programs like our Molly Cotton program where there's no evidence of impact at all. We had like 17 different indicators. I think, I think 17 out of 18 indicators, there was no dif difference at all between the, the comparison group and, 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 and uh, the, the intervention group. And, and the comparison group was quite plausible. When you, when you compare the comparison group on all the different characteristics, when you juxtapose the two groups, there's very little difference in terms of their observable characteristics. So we had a pretty strong uh, comparison group for this one, and there was no difference on multiple indicators. Now I just want to talk a little bit about uh, kind of a reality check on, on you know, how, how much are these, the, the results of these effectiveness reviews being taken up by country teams and actually being used to change and enhance programming. So we do have some positive st uh, success stories. We had a, a weekend campaign um, in Bangladesh which was just trying to uh, do this popular mobilization uh, campaign with change makers trying to get people to change their attitudes about violence against women and, and ultimately to reduce uh, intramarital violence against women. But we found in the, in the four districts that we, that we looked at, there was only evidence of impact in one district. And in this district, there was intense implementation. So then other districts, weak implementation, only impact in, in, in the district with strong implementation. So with these findings, the, 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 the existing secretariat in, in, in Bangladesh that's taken over the program is, is using them to strengthen the existing campaign. But our uh, Oxfam's uh, country team there is also using um, this kind of learning to inform the design of new, its new um, nationwide popular mobilization campaigns on other issues as well. Um, v uh, Vietnam, uh, unfortunately in this, this study, again, we had a pretty good comparison group, but we had no evidence of impact on agricultural production measures, income and food security measures. Um, we're using consumption expenditure as well, and, and there is a lot of measurement error in, in, in looking at that. But, but even on uh, house, uh, indicators of household wealth, like household assets um, and things like that, there was no evidence of any impact. Um, and there was a real realization in the country team that, that this is really likely because of the low intensity of the, of the nature of the project. Um, and uh, we found that there was the nutrition of this these particular populations really poor, and they're using um, you know that those findings and in, into feeding into uh, future programming. And uh, in our kind of a campaigning work uh, in uh, Palestine, um, it was clear that the kind of the interventions for this campaigning work were not kind of well joined up as part of a longer term strategy. And now um, uh, Oxfam is, is, is working with its partners to develop a longer term planning approach and um, that, that's, that's more strategic but it's still workable and, 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 change and, and can adapt to the complex and dynamic context. We have cases of not so positive examples as well. Um, we have the, kind of the North Karamoja Development Project. Um, there's no evidence of, of any impact on income, food security, even self-reported agriculture production, um, just nothing at all. Unfortunately, the findings just were not accepted by the, the program team there. And in this particular context, there, there's a very high level of dependency. I mean, they've, uh, be, these, this population has been really hard done by and have been given um, food aid for, um, since the 1960s. So because of this cultural dependency, um, the, the program team kind of is, is like, you know, no matter what you're asking, I think it's some part of a need, needs assessment. So they're, they're going to respond by um, um, trying to portray themselves as much worse off than they are. So they just don't trust um, the, the information that we came up with. So kind of a lesson learned in some context, you know, to make a more convincing case, maybe you want to use anthropometric measures, weighing children and um, body mass index, these kind of things to avoid this kind of scenario. Um, another case with, with our uh, pro value chain project in Guatemala, um, we had some positive results in some of the women's empowerment measures that we used, but nothing on the livelihoods uh, uh, measures. The project that happened to be randomly selected was actually too immature, so similar to some of the, 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 the cases of, of um, MCC is, is, is talk, was talking about. But then um, my colleague who was, who was doing the collection, data collection um, looked at the activities of an older project, but still nevertheless the country team just couldn't accept the findings. And our program funding 
department kind of looked at the red light, the red traffic light that this project, this, in fact, this review got on <coughs> income, and actually um, uh, was trying to decide not to, to no longer fundraise for the program. So obviously the, the country team went up in arms and, and there's all this miscommunication, misunderstanding and, and you know my team does not want the effectiveness reviews to result in this kind of action. So um, it's a bit of an internal controversy. Oh, frozen again. It's unfrozen. Um, some surprising and mixed cases as well. Um, we had one uh, effectiveness review that we did in the Philippines, and there was an initial strong reluctance of, of the country team to engage in the process, but um, they really got into it, and now uh, the, the team is interested in replicating this methodology that we're using on a completed project, and now they recognize the importance of having a, a, a strong counterfactual, so they're interested in doing this difference in difference design on a newer big program. So it's really had a, a, a good result there. Uh, kind of a mixed case is with our program leadership team. So we have all the kind of the senior managers of the organization that come together, the regional directors, the international directors, and other senior people in the organization. And they come together every once in a while um, for some strategic planning and uh, decision making. And they really used all the results of the effectiveness reviews um, throughout the whole two days they were meeting but a lot of the findings are taking them out of context, they're misinterpreting, extrapolating the results, kind of using, you know, the traffic lights to support their arguments and um, not ideally how we wanted to see them used. Um, just my last, set, my last little part here, um, going forward, um, how are we trying to strengthen in terms of use? Um, one of the things that we want to try to really do is to, to make kind of the measurement more intuitive and, and pr pr uh, programmatically useful for program staff. And we're looking at, you know, a lot of times we do factor analysis on kind of the current scales and we come up with these continuous um, measures that no one understands. So we, we've um, kind of partnering with the, the Oxford Poverty and uh, Human Development Initiative looking, looking at some of their approaches. Um, and, and they, they, they've done, a, in over 130 countries, this multi-dimensional um, poverty index. And, and this index is based on kind of these, uh, all the kind of composite indicators of all these binary, um, binary, binary defined kind of, you're either above or you're below um, indicators. And uh, this graph here looks a little complicated, but basically it shows that kind of the, the, the more thick um, the, the rectangle is, the more deprivation there is. So we can, we can see in there are certain indicators where actually both the intervention group and the comparison group is doing well. Um, those are things that will, don't necessarily need programmatic attention. But in, in terms of some of the thicker um, uh, uh, rectangles, these are th things that um, uh, could require some more attention. So if you look, just for an example, if you look at the, the second to last one, knowledge of disaster risk from, um, management plan, um, there is a big difference between the intervention and comparison group, but there's still a high level of deprivation in the intervention group, so it's still an area that needs programmatic attention, even though um, the, better, the intervention group is better off. So, so kind of using this, um, we're, we're trying to really develop this so that it can really, uh, the results can really feed into decision making at the country level. The other thing is we plan to do, but it never really worked out, is to try to integrate these effectiveness reviews with planned final evaluations. Um, so, you know, trying to make sure there's a strong overlap. Um, that's going to happen more this year, but uh, it's definitely an area that we need to improve in. And uh, trying to really get staff to really behind these things and, and maybe throwing a few more carrots in, in addition to having the, 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 the international director and, and the whole chain of command with a, with a stick, you know, trying to give them some incentives. So trying to tag along tra extra training to the effectiveness reviews um, on, on different kind of a monitoring and evaluation topics that uh, they're, they're interested in learning about. Um, the other key thing we learned is that we really need to make sure it's not just getting program staff involved, it's getting the right program staff involved and that can make a difference because some of the cases that we have, we have junior um, program staff uh, that are involved and you know, they'll be involved but then no change really happens. But if we, if we get some 
in cases we've had uh, people that are that are key kind of decision makers within the programming teams and involved in the process and believing in the findings and believing what's coming out, it's, it's much more likely to to lead to change and improve programming. Um, and then another thing we're we're doing is actually monitoring. We have uh, one of the the uh, the persons in our team is is um, following up and looking at the implementation of the management responses and providing kind of coaching and support and encouragement on on, on how to actually ensure that they get implemented and change actually comes out. And finally, um, we're undertaking a lot of effort to ensure to try to get better at communicating um, the defectiveness review findings. I mean, what do things really mean? And we want to do more in terms of synthesis um, with an increasing number of these uh, effectiveness reviews that we're carrying out, like what key learnings can come out. We definitely want to kind of avoid scenes like this where, where, where things are getting misunderstood and taken out of context. And um, uh, we ultimately just want to see that, that this, uh, this, whole, this whole effort leads to, to better quality programming and more impactful programming. Thank you. Great, Carl, thanks very much. I'm going to take over control now. Um, just wanted to remind everyone that if you have a question, please um, go ahead and, and type it into the question box here. Um, Carl, we actually have um, already a question that's uh, posed towards you. Um, and the question is, how committed was senior management to evaluation? Was it real or was it mainly lip service? <laughs> okay, um, I, I think it's, it's generally real, but it, it definitely comes from the, the I, I think to be honest, it comes from a lot from the external environment here in, in the United Kingdom. We have a conservative government that's in power right now, really putting pressure on, on um, in the UK, the, the 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 there was cuts throughout every every different uh, all areas of the of the of the government's budget, except for the the National Health Service and for international development. So, the budget is really under high level of scrutiny, and there's a lot of pressure to make sure that that there's results are being delivered uh, on the back of um, developmental aid. Thanks, Carl. Um, Jack and Catherine, I imagine that. Um, you all are facing some similar pressures uh, given the, the budget environment here in the U.S. as well. Maybe do you have a, a similar experience about how that external pressure is affecting the utilization of the impact evaluation results you've conducted? Um, not really. Uh, it's, we're, I mean, obviously year to year, we're on pins and needles. We don't know what's going to come out of this um, budget cycle. You know, we've been treated relatively well uh, by the U.S. government, um, while overall uh, investments in foreign assistance have been going down. We've held roughly steady for the last two or three years, um, partly because we've got support from both Democrats who tend to be strongly supportive of, of international development and Republicans who are strongly supportive of accountability and we're sort of a, a nice intersection of the two. Um, if we take a hit, uh, where it will show up is not entirely clear, but senior management here coming through these first five, this role out of the first five evaluations, senior management seems quite um, committed yeah. to, uh, to continuing rigorous evaluations. And the support that we get from Capitol Hill has been, again, strongly supportive of this evaluation uh, component of what we do. So I, I think that we're responding to the fact that there is a constituency within Congress that wants to see this accountability. And, and so we've done so, we've done well so far but uh, no guarantees what will happen. And I don't, and as far as what does this mean for, do we do ag projects or do we do farmer training projects, I think uh, the conclusions we're coming to, is, is, that's not the conclusions we're coming to, it's, it's, it's how do we apply these learnings to our active and future ag interventions to have them be 
be more effective and, and not just assume what we always thought worked works, because that's one of the main findings here. We've learned things other than, in addition to starter kits, about duration of training and content of training. There's a lot of, lot of rich data that, that are going to help us inform projects. And, you know, we're demand driven, so if a country puts out that they want to do ag, we're going to really use the, the, the information and learning from these evaluations to make sure we um, go forward with something that's better. Great. Thank you both. Um, we have another question for Oxfam GB, and I think this is a very common one as well. Um, more or less, what is the budget amount specifically on each ERS? Yeah, I mean, um, we're really doing these on a shoestring. Um, so, uh, out excluding staff time, about fifteen thousand dollars per evaluation. So, uh, yeah, they're, they're, they're qu we're doing them quite quite cheaply, and and uh, that's why we do a lot of the the, the quantitative work. We um, do them in house. There's a team of, of three of us that actually look after that. We hire national consultants to support us doing the data collection. We parachute into countries. We make sure everything is set up. We make sure we try to make our best to make sure a plausible comparison um, group is 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 identified. Um, make sure all the sampling is done. Make sure the numerators are are, are trained. Questionnaire is is well developed. Um, and then when we're we're the initial stages of data collection, when we're we're sure the questionnaires are being administered properly, then we then we come back and we let the the the, the national consultant um, wrap up the work and and enter the data, and then we do the data analysis here. So we've tried to take measures to really keep them down because that is, you know, we couldn't say okay, we need three hundred thousand uh, per effectiveness review to senior management. That just wouldn't go down. So th th we are um, under serious budget constraints for carrying these out. Great. Um, another question that I think could be goes for for both our presenters or both organizations. Um, what have you learned about facilitation in terms of discussion, processing of findings by management and staff? Um, this person notes that we know evaluators aren't necessarily strong facilitators. Um, but. It, it, you're absolutely right. Our, our impact evaluators um, have been selected largely for their technical expertise in designing and conducting impact evaluations. Um, and we're still working on how you take a set of technical results and make them digestible to a broad audience. Um, you know, I, I need to be clear, we do have an audience that wants highly precise technical reports because these are the people who do this type of stuff who are going to be uh, are going to, you know do you believe these evaluations and they're going to want to know about the technical quality of the evaluation so our evaluators write for a, a narrow but very strategic strategic audience um, we've gotten an enormous amount of support from our congressional and public affairs group who have really helped us try to understand what is the level, what types of communication and what types of questions are asked by our different groups of stakeholders. And we did a, a fair amount of outreach in between receiving these evaluations and, and our rollout. And, and what we have on our website actually includes a mixture of things. One, it, one which is geared to a relatively non-technical audience um, to sort of answer the relatively simple questions, and then the detailed reports that are really uh, focusing on the more technically demanding user. I don't know that we have the mixture right, but what has been clear is that these technical reports are, are good for a very narrow audience, and, and we need to make sure that the broader set of stakeholders are, are addressed as well. Carl, did you have yeah, anything you wanted to yeah. add? That's quite similar on, on our end. So we've, we've uh, I mean, we do a couple of things. One is when we have uh, kind of the draft reports ready, we, we share them with, with the country teams, the program teams, and then we have a, a big 
hour, hour and a half long kind of uh, teleconference to unpack the findings, what they mean, um, what they accept, what they, they don't accept. That's one of the things we do. The other thing is, is uh, like I presented in my presentation, is these, these shorter reports, less technical reports, and the traffic lights. But, uh, but again, you know, people take those out of context and, you know, it, it's, a, it's a red light on household income and, and the whole project has failed and it, it, sometimes they'll, 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 it may just be a project in a, in a wider program and they may extrapolate the, the negative finding to the, to, to the whole program and, and there's a lot of things we need to get better at it, at communicating kind of the, the limitations of, of, or how to interpret what, what's coming out of these findings. So there's still um, more work that we need to, to, to undertake along those lines. Um, thanks, Carl and, and Jack. Um, we have, Carl, a couple of questions for you, um, somewhat related. First, uh, how much time does your team spend on supporting communication and use of the effectiveness reviews, um, things like developing summaries, following up on management responses? And then a second question, um, oops, uh, what kind of carrots do you plan to offer to to staff to further increase usage of the effectiveness reviews to balance with the sticks. Uh, so, so the first question, kind of, how much time we spend? You know, we spend a lot of time on on kind of the, the management response and communicating findings and trying to develop these communication projects. So it's, I mean, if you look at the whole portfolio work, I mean, it's at least thirty percent of what we have to get up to, or at least twenty five percent. So a lot of uh, a lot of effort that has to go in there. Um, and in, in terms of carrots, um, I, I mean it's 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 like I said in the presentation. I mean we're trying to uh, use training. I mean a lot of the the, the when we get staff that are really keen on doing M and E and they're involved in the, in the, the, the report, um, in, in the whole process, they really gain a lot out of it. One of the big drawbacks is that we do do the data analysis here um, in house and, and you know using Stata and very complicated things that we're doing, it's difficult to kind of decentralize that and, and, and get staff more involved in, in that process. So there is still things that we need to explore. But I would really be happy if anyone has any ideas to either email me or, or so, somehow um, communicate uh, better ways we can kind of incentivize staff to, to, to get into these things and, and to, to use the findings. Great. Um, and I think the next question will need to be our, our last question because we're a little bit out of time. Um, and apologies for that. Um, this question is for the MCC. Um, given the relatively weak findings for, for at least some of these evaluations compared with their costs, has senior management started to become um, gun shy of expensive evaluations, particularly when the results that are produced are late in coming? Um, I think that what we have seen is not a gun shyness about it, but a, I mean, let me put this in context. Uh, these look like relatively expensive evaluations, but we're, we're somewhere between 4 and 5% of our investment portfolio is going into these. So in terms of, the question that they're asking is, are we learning enough from these to warrant the investment in evaluations. And what that's caused us to do is say, are we learning enough to ensure that we're going to improve what we do? Um, and so the answer to the question is, they haven't become gun shy, they've be become more demanding. They want to make sure that we're learning what works and why. Because they, as a portion of what we invest, it's a relatively small portion, as long as we are learning how to do things better. I think David, um, the author of our guidance note, would agree with your, with your response. Um, so Jack, Catherine, and, and Carl, I just want to thank you again so much for your presentations and for being so open and sharing your experiences. Like I said, we are out of time for questions, um, and I just want to do a couple of things in terms of wrap-up. So some quick next steps before I conclude our session. Um, 
First, if we didn't get to your question, here is the contact information for our three presenters. Um, second, we would like to hear your feedback on today's webinar, so please take a moment to complete the survey you'll receive in a follow-up email, and you'll also likely hear from me again a little further down the road to get your feedback on the series overall. Um, and third, don't forget that all the guidance notes and materials from the webinars are available at, at this link. Um, though the webinars are over, we also working on the translations for guidance notes three and four, so please watch for those. And this is a screenshot of all the materials that are available on that link so far. Um, so as I said at the beginning of this, ish, this session, um, this is, I'm sad to say, the last webinar in our Impact Evaluation Guidance Note and Webinar Series. Uh, over the past several months, we've tried to bring you some practical guidance about why and how to do impact evaluation and how to ensure it actually makes a difference um, from some of the top experts on this topic. We've also heard how impact evaluation plays out in the real world, especially in NGOs with presentations from eight different organizations who've shared their approach to impact evaluation, what they've learned from their experiences, and some of the things they're still struggling with. So I really hope you found these webinars along with the guidance notes not just interesting but actually useful, and that you feel that the series has contributed, at least in some small way, to making impact evaluation better and more relevant. Um, so thanks very much again to all of you for joining us, and please enjoy and make use of these materials. Thank you very much.